Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu My dear respected brothers and sisters Insha'Allah ta'ala tonight we're going to study the summary of Islamic jurisprudence this book was authored by Sheikh Al-Allama, Sheikh Saleh bin Fuzan Al-Fuzan, Hafidahullah. And it's a very simple book that teaches the affairs of Al-Fiqh, jurisprudence. And we are studying about affairs that have to do with Al-Hajj. And the Sheikh is uh, speaking about those actions that are prohibited to do while you are in a state of ihram, whether you are performing umrah or you are performing al-hajj. The sheikh said, prohibition number eight, a muhrim is prohibited to have sexual intercourse for Allah exalted be he says, so whoever has made Hajj obligatory upon himself therein, by entering the state of Ihram, there is to be for him no sexual relations. So basically, there is no marital relations once you enter in the, into that state of Ihram. Before that and after that, it's permissible for you but not during that period when you enter Al-Ihram. And the Sheikh is going to explain more. He said, according to Ibn Abbas, it refers to the activity of engaging in sexual intercourse to clarify if a man is in a state of Ihram, i.e. a muhrim, has sexual intercourse with his wife, before the first release from Ihram, it will invalidate his Hajj. So his Hajj will be null void. His Hajj will be null void. It means that he has to repeat his Hajj the next year or whenever he is able to do it. So that's why it's extremely important for us, my dear respected brothers and sisters, to learn these rulings so that you would not fall into some mistakes like this, and then you have to start all over again. So the Sheikh, he said, Hafidahullah Ta'ala, he said that, um, طيب, he said, before, if, if a muhrim has sexual intercourse, with his wife before the first release from Ihram. So we have to know what is the first release from Ihram. The first release, Barakallahu Fikum, is on the day of the 10th of the Hijjah, because you start the Hajj on the 8th of the Hijjah, which is the day of Tarwiyah. That's the day you start the Hajj, right? And then on the 10th of the Hijjah, which is the day of Eid, you do three things. You do three things on that day. The first one, you stone. You stone Jamarat al-Aqab al-Kubra, the biggest monument. The biggest monument, you stone. Tayyip. So you stone on the 10th of the Hijjah, which is the day of Eid. So this is the first thing you do. You do the stoning of the biggest monument, because there are three monuments. You have the biggest, and you have the middle, and then you have the small. So you do the biggest one only. You don't do the other one, just the biggest one only. And then you shave your hair, and shaving is better than shortening, because the Prophet ﷺ 
He made dua for those who shave. He made dua for those who shave. So shaving is better. طيب? This is just for the males. This is for the males. For the, me- the females, they take only a fingertip from their hair. They hold the, the hair together and they take only, they cut only a fingertip, the size of a fingertip. طيب. Now this man, after he did the stoning of the biggest monument, then he shaved his hair, right? He shaved off his hair and then he did the sacrificial animal. He did the sacrificial animal. All these three acts of hajj, Right? They, these are the rites of Hajj. These three, they are done on the day of Eid. The day of Eid, which is the 10th of the Hijjah. Now, if he, if, he, if he does these three, then he is now half released. That's what his, the Sheikh is talking about. So now he is half released from his Ihram. He is half released from his Ihram. Now, before that, before he does these three, If he had relations with his wife, right? If he had relations, marital relations with his wife, his hajj is null void. His hajj is null void. So he has to do it again. But he cannot just say, well, I messed up. My hajj is null void. I'm just going to pack up my suitcase and go back home. He can't do it. He has to continue. He has to continue to finish all the rights of Hajj. And the Sheikh is going to talk about that inshallah ta'ala. So he said, yet it is obligatory for him to continue performing the rest of the rights of Hajj. For Allah exalted be, he says, وَأَتِمُّ الْحَجَّ وَالْعُمْرَةَ لِلَّهِ in Surah Al-Baqarah. And complete Hajj and Umrah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This in Surah Al-Baqarah. Ayah 196, 196. Still, it is obligatory for such a person to re-perform Hajj the following year. So he has to do it again. You see? That's why it's very important for us to learn these rules. That's why we don't make mistakes. We don't make mistakes. So, and in case you do, you know what to do. You know what to do. The following year. And to slaughter, okay, not only that. So his hajj is null void. His hajj is null void. But also there is a kafara, there is an expiation. There is an expiation for violating that state of sacredness. That state of being in a state of ihram. That state of ihram because this person, he violated it. So he has to expiate uh, also. So the Sheikh, he said, Hafidahullah Ta'ala, he said, and to slaughter a camel or a cow, a camel or a cow. On the other hand, if a muhrim has sexual intercourse with his wife after the first release of Ihram, after he did the three, remember the three? Stoning the biggest monument and shaving off his head, his hair, shaving off his head, and then, and then, doing the sacrificial animal. So this is the first release. So let's say he had a relationship after the first release, right? His hajj is still considered valid. His hajj is still considered valid. So and the, the, he's not like the first one. He's not like the first one. The first one who had relationship before he did those three. Huh? So that one, his hajj is gone. So he has to redo it again. But this one, he doesn't have to redo it again. But what he did, he violated his ihram, right? He violated his ihram. He did not invalidate his hajj. He did not invalidate. So there's a big difference. Tayyip, the sheikh, he said, Hafidahullah ta'ala, provided that, that, that he slaughters a sheep in expiation. So he slaughters a sheep in expiation. So he has only one kafara. He has only one kafara. Ninth, a muhrim is prohibited to touch his wife or any woman lustfully. 
lustfully with lust and desires, such as kissing or the like, as these are among the acts that lead to sexual intercourse. Therefore, the muhrim must avoid sexual intercourse, lewdness, and dispute. For Allah exalted be he says in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah 197. فَمَنْ فَرَضَ فِيهِنَّ الْحَجَّ فَلَا رَفَتَ وَلَا فُسُوقَ وَلَا جِدَالَ فِي الْحَجِّ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So whoever has made hajj obligatory upon himself therein, by entering the state of ihram, there is to be for him no sexual relations, and no disobedience, and no disputing during hajj. This is in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 197. The verse refers to the actual sexual intercourse and any related matters that lead to it, such as kissing, touching, winking, or talking about sex, or the like. Because now you have the actual act and you have the means that leads to it. And the Sharia, Barakallah Fikum, the Islamic law, Walillahi alhamd, وَلِلَّهِ الْحَمْدِ came as a Sheikh Abd al-Rahman bin Sa'idi rahimahu Allah. He said, الدِّينُ مَبْنِيٌ عَلَى الْمَصَالِحِ فِي, جرب, في جَلْبِهَا وَالدَّرْءِ لِلْقَبَائِحِ The religion of Islam is based upon bringing about, bringing about benefit and wording of harm and evil. So, the means, barakallahu feekum, they have the same ruling as their objective. The means, they have the same ruling as their objective. So, kissing and winking and other than that, these are means. So they would lead to that which is haram. So they will also be considered haram because the means, they have the same uh, ruling as their objective. Like for example, walking. Walking, it is permissible. There is nothing wrong with walking. But if you, when you walk to the masjid with the intention to perform the salat at door, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for walking to the masjid because you're walking to achieve that which is an act of worship and which is obligatory and something that Allah loves, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you get rewarded for, do, for doing that. On the contrary, if you walk to commit a sin, if you walk to commit a sin, walking in itself it is permissible, but because you're using it to commit a sin, walking becomes haram. Likewise, in ulama, they mention that selling grapes, grapes, the origin when it comes to grapes, it's halal. But selling grapes for, tam- for someone who's going to turn it into alcoholic beverages, then it is haram for you to sell grapes to that person. Because now the means becomes haram, even though it is something halal in itself, but it will serve to achieve that which is haram. So these are, this is a very important qaida, al-ulama, they mention, al-shaykh Abdul Rahman ibn Nasr al-Sa'di, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned it, he said, وَسَائِلُ الْأَحْكَامِ كَالْمَقَاصِدِ وَسَائِلُ الْأَحْكَامِ كَالْمَقَاصِدِ وَسَائِلُ الْأَحْكَامِ, the means, the means that are related to the ruling, right? They are like the objectives, same thing. So the means leads to the objective. So if the mean is halal, uh, if the objective is halal, the mean is halal. If the objective is haram, the mean will be haram, and so on and so forth. If the objective is something obligatory, then the mean also becomes obligatory. Like for example, you want to perform salat, salat, Salat uh, al-Fajr, for example, and you could not find water except for sale. Except for sale, and you have money to purchase that water, right? So it becomes obligatory upon you to purchase that water. Because that water is a mean to achieve that, which is an obligatory act of worship, which is Salat al-Fajr. And you can give example uh, about this qaida in different situations. So whatever leads to that which is Mubah, which is mubah, permissible, is mubah. Whatever leads to that which is haram, is haram. Whatever leads to that which is obligatory, it is obligatory. And so on and so forth. 
The Sheikh Hafidahullah Ta'ala, Sheikh Salih bin Fuzan al Fuzan, he said, disobedience, disobedience, as Allah mentioned in the ayah, in the aforesaid verse, means committing sins, which is a grave act to do while being in a state of ihram. Whereas a Muslim is supposed to be in a state of devotion and supplication. So how can you commit a sin while you are in a state of ibadah? You're in a state of ibadah, so you're supposed to be devoted to that act of worship. So you should not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Disputing, which is prohibited. Quarreling, disputing. So which is prohibited for a muhrim. It refers to arguing about matters that do not concern one. That do not concern one. Quarreling with one's pilgrim mates, insulting others, etc. However, it is permissible for a muhrim to argue for the sake of showing the right, in joining good or forbidding evil. For argument is a divine command. In such case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said... And argue with them in a way that is best. So now, dispute and quarreling, the origin when it comes to it, it is haram. Unless it has to do with enjoining good and forbidding evil. Like for example, someone is committing shirk, for example, right? So you correct them. You correct them and you you enjoin good and you forbid evil. Because you can't just say, well, I am performing umrah and hajj. I'm not supposed to argue. No. Here, you argue with him in, the, in, a, in, a, in a good way. In a good way. And you clarify to him that this is shirk. That this is shirk. Calling upon the Prophet wasallam is shirk. You nullify your hajj. You nullify your Islam if you do that. You nullify all your good deeds. So you clarify that to him gently. It is an act of the sunnah, prophetic tradition, for the muhrim to talk less, except in matters of benefit. Don't, don't talk except if you have to. If you have to, and there is some benefit, you want to share like a benefit with your colleagues and the like, with your mates that are going with you in Hajj and the like. Alhamdulillah, this is good. But don't be like those just waste their time just talking, 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 talking. And there is no benefit. And there is no Benefit, lip service, a lot of lip service, but there is no actions. Don't be like like those people. Don't waste your time. Do not waste your time. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, By the time man is in a state of loss, except those who believe, and work righteous deeds, and enjoin upon one another to be on the truth and enjoin upon one another to be patient. So, ibadah requires patience, requires a person to be wise, to be wise. Don't waste your time talking. Busy yourself with the recitation of the Quran, right? Busy yourself with the recitation of the Quran. Al-Adkar, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, and the like. This is, this is more beneficial for you than just talking, talking, talking. He said, except in matters of benefit. If there is a benefit, yes, we talk. We talk. If there is a benefit, we talk. It is narrated in the two sahih on the authority of Abu Huraira that the Prophet wasallam said, he who believes in Allah on the last day should either say something good or keep silent. Look at this. Either you say something good you keep silent because if you do that, subhanallah, you save your deen and you save your honor. And subhanallah, you save your hasanat too. You save your good deed. Because when you talk too much, most likely you're going to make mistakes. You see? So it is better not to talk a lot. Talk less. As one of the Salaf, Bishr al-Hafi, rahimahullah, he said, إِذَا عَجَبَكَ الْكَلَامِ إِذَا عَجَبَكَ الْكَلَامِ فَصْمُتْ وَإِذَا عَجَبَكَ الصَّمْتُ فَتَكَلَّمْ He said, when you feel like talking, be quiet. And when you feel like being, be, being quiet, talk. How many of us are like that? How many of us? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all al-ilm al-nafi' al-amal al-salih. And then he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, also said, 
in a hadith marfu' traceable hadith a sign of one's good observance of islam is living alone what does not concern him min husni islam al mar'i tarkuhu ma la ya'ni anything that doesn't concern me there's no benefit in it i live it alone I don't get get involved in it. Some people talking to each other. I don't go and tell them, what are you talking about? And you're trying to be nosy and trying to find out what they're talking about. This is not from the etiquette of Islam. This is not from the etiquette of Islam. Or some people, they're talking about their private matters, marital, ma- marital manner, uh, you know, matters and stuff like that. You don't just come and get involved. No, this doesn't concern you. You leave it. You leave it to those people. It is also recommended for a muhrim to be preoccupied with chanting talbiyah. لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ لَبَّيْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ لَبَّيْكَ إِنَّ الْحَمْدَ وَالنِّعْمَةَ لَكَ وَالْمُلْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all al-ilm al-nafi' wal-amal salih walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.